Welcome to Authentically Debs, a podcast about a southern girl looking at 70. Okay, so we are moving to Little Rock from the little town in southern, in southwest Arkansas of Stamps. We're moving to the biggest city in Arkansas, Little Rock. Actually, we're moving to a suburb, Jacksonville, because that is where the Little Rock Air Force Base was. And that's where my mother was going to teach. When I first got to Jacksonville, which was a huge place, not nearly as big as Little Rock, the city, but the suburb of Jacksonville had about thirty to 35,000 people, and considering Stamps had less than 2,000, this, this was a biggie for me. Um, I had to go to the junior high school. I was in eighth grade. I was... So awkward looking. I wouldn't say I was ugly, but I wouldn't say I was great looking either. I had braces. My hair, I had just had a permanent, so that meant my hair was curlier than I would have liked it to have been. I always had thin hair anyway, but in fact, I think my hair is thicker now than it's ever been, but it was a huge huge change for me. I was no longer in the same school where my mother taught uh, or even the same school district. But I I think I was probably 13 or 14 and fortunately I would see better days ahead. And still my adventure with my wonderfully different mother continued. Keeping in mind that although she always took care of me financially and supported me, with, frankly, very little help from my father, who I believe sent her $100 a month for child support until he had me emancipated as soon as I graduated so he would no longer have to pay. And I think he loved me. He was, uh, like me sometimes, just very selfish. Um, But at any rate, my mother took care of me financially supported me in lots of ways, but she did always remain a child emotionally. And being the only person there with her, I was her caretaker, especially after we moved away from Haynesville and we were on our own. Um, And like I think I may have said earlier, that's a lot to put on a kid, but my mother was extraordinary and she was more than worth it. I don't mean to be redundant, but she considered me her world. I think she might have dated maybe twice, definitely once. She It was awkward for her. The man came to our home. She introduced me, and she hated it, and she didn't like him. My mother uh, was in love with my father. He was the love of her life. They started out as friends, probably because... That's as much as she could hope for at that time. But once they began dating, and my dad had been married once before he married my mother, she just fell in love with him. That was, he he was it for mom. Well, I guess that's all I want to say about that. Oh, and also, I have outlived both of my parents. My dad, and I may go into more of this later, but my dad died at age 55 after he had retired from the Air Force he began selling real estate. He he tried chartering planes, he, but he was never really happy after he could no longer fly those fighter jets. And having made the Air Force his career, he was also still an active alcoholic. And um, he died at 55, and my mother um, died shortly thereafter. She was a little older than my father, but she couldn't have been more than 60 years old when she died. So I've outlived both of them. And um, I often think I'm living on borrowed time. And I really 
because both my parents died untimely deaths. I don't know, I just have a lot of questions that I'd love for them to be here to be able to answer, but they're not. Okay, um, I remained in Arkansas until after I was married and had two daughters, but there's there's a lot to tell you about my time in the first part of my time in Little Rock. Once we got there and kind of got settled, it just so happened that President Kennedy was our president at that time, and he visited uh, Little Rock, and he landed at the Little Rock Air Force Base, and my mother was one of the teachers at the Little Rock Air Force Base Elementary, so they got to go to the airport, and if not meet the president, they got to see the president. And my mother, at that day, actually got to shake his hand, and Suffice to say, but really an understatement, is that she was completely smitten with JFK after that and thought he was the most handsome man she had ever seen. And she just never stopped talking about how handsome he was. Also that year, unfortunately, President Kennedy was assassinated. I was in eighth grade. At that time, it was considered junior high so it was just consisted of the 7th and 8th grade, and then grades 9 through 12 were high school. But I was in Mr. Murphy's history class when suddenly the school's loudspeaker came on. If you're old enough, you can remember those loudspeakers in each classroom. And this lady who was a teacher, I guess she didn't have a class that period. Her name was Miss Noble. Funny how we remember things like that. But she s said in her inimitable way, the President of the United States has been shot and seriously wounded in Dallas, Texas. Stay tuned. Well, my history teacher, Mr. Murphy, was, thank goodness, a very kind, hip teacher, even in those days. And he was also a fan of President Kennedy. And I remember after that announcement that he left the classroom briefly, and when he returned momentarily, he had tears in his eyes. Then shortly after that, and I guess he had stepped, I guess he was just shocked and needed a moment away from us because we were just kind of in shock too, but certainly not to the degree that he probably was. But soon after he returned, really before he could say much of anything to us about it, that same horrid female voice came back on and simply said, the President of the United States is dead. I won't ever forget the silence after that message, that awful terrible silence. And soon after, I remember that school was dismissed. We got out of school early that day. And for the next few days, my mother and I were completely glued to our black and white television. We even saw Oswald get shot live. And I remember, obviously these were days when we were not in school. The country was in mourning. I remember that into about the third day of nonstop TV news coverage of the assassination, I said to my poor mother, gee, I hope I don't ever do something like that one day, meaning assassinating a president. Well, that literally scared my mother to death. She immediately grabbed me and told me we were going for a long ride in our Chevy Impala. And we did. So regarding both of our mental illnesses, she wanted to get my anxious, exhausted teenage mind off of all of this. And it worked, especially with the addition of the large ice cream cone from the Dairy Queen, where we stopped and talked to friends. Well, haven't spoken very little really so far about my far away Air Force pilot father, and somewhat more about my one-of-a-kind mother. I can say that by age 20, for me, both of them would be dead, and both would die untimely deaths as well. My dad was first, 
and that was when I was 19. I remember when I graduated high school, my dad came and I graduated from Jacksonville High School, that suburb of Little Rock. And by that time, he was retired from the Air Force as a colonel. And I think I mentioned he, he really wasn't happy after he retired. And even when he wasn't retired, he was still an active alcoholic. And I remember I saw the film, The Real Life Story of Such a Man in Flight with Denzel Washington. And like that man, but not exactly like that man. But my dad was a good pilot and apparently could fly drunk, too. He was truly a decorated war veteran in both North Korea and the Korean War. But he died in bed with my already gravely ill elderly grandfather who was in his mid to late 80s. We called him Papa. My grandfather lived in a little town, or actually it was not even a town, it was a little community just out of Haynesville, and it was a very small community of only about 300 people, but they did have a school, and he was the president of the school board at one time. But my dad died in my grandfather's old country home, and he and my grandfather died of carbon monoxide poisoning from a vault a faulty floor vent in Papa's old home. I remember my dad's sister, my Aunt Hilda, was there and she was in another room and I think she woke up and by that time it was the afternoon and she felt very nauseated and she went into Papa's bedroom and found both of them in Papa's bed because she and my dad would take turns being with him, being close to him so they could monitor him and she found both of them dead. What a shock. She adored my father and adored her father. I'll also mention at this time, sports fanatic that I am, that Carl Malone, the famed NBA player, was also from Summerfield, Louisiana, the little community where my grandfather had a general store. There was only, I think, there was There was just a highway that ran through Summerfield, and my grandfather had a general store and a gas station. And then I think there was a post office and probably two other types of businesses, and then there was a church, and that was it. And then across the, on the other side of the highway was the school and the cemetery. My grandfather used to make these incredible squirrel mulligans, And once, um, because I listen to sports radio, once years ago they had Carl Malone on and he was speaking to people and you know you have to be screened before they'll put you through. And I got put through because I said I'm also from Summerfield where Carl is from. Well, that was not entirely true, but it was pretty close, Haynesville. And so when I got on the phone with him, I said, Carl, do you know what a squirrel mulligan is? And he said, hell yeah, I do. And of course he did, because it was, it was like squirrel stew. And, uh, my grandfather, um, made the best. It was, and I can't believe I ate it looking back, but I did. And he made it very hot and spicy. And everybody, around would come to that big annual squirrel mulligan. And the delicacy of the mulligan was the squirrel's head. And people that were lucky enough to get a squirrel's head would take it and just suck, I guess, all the brains out of it. I mean, it was cooked, but it was squirrel brains. So anyway, I'm going to move on from that. Let's see more about my dad. I mentioned that he came to my graduation. I did visit him uh, once, I think, before my graduation. I think it was about 16. That's when he was living in Montgomery, Alabama, which is where he was stationed for a while during his Air Force career. And he loved to go to the officers club. And he he was retired, but he still, of course, could go to the officers club. And he loved taking me to the officers club. Because being 16, some of the people at the officer's club thought I was his date. Now, that's gross and perverted and everything else. But And my dad never molested me. I I used to try to remember, did he molest me? Because when he would come home for visits, um, 
once or twice a year, we would always stay at my grandfather's, Papa's in Summerfield. And I would sleep in the bed with my dad, uh, I'm sure. And I didn't by the time I was 16, obviously. But when I was a, a kid, you know, like seven or eight or something, I would sleep in the double or queen size, whatever it was, bed with my dad. And I always tried to remember, did he molest me? And guess what? No, he never did. Um, but I do remember that he wore boxers and a t-shirt. That's what he slept in. So he came to my graduation. And then shortly after my graduation, um, I was dating my husband, uh, who was a f- almost the first boy I ever dated. And... Um, at that time, I had only dated one other boy, and I think I'd only had one date before my husband, and was only with one other person sexually uh, before my marriage with my husband. I don't know how much I want to go into that, but maybe. But um, I remember when I met my ex-husband. He was three years older than me, and I was in ninth grade, and he was a freshman in college, and he was playing, he was a great football player. He was, he was not tall, but he was, he was stocky, and he was just an awesome football player, running back and defensive end, I think. And he was going to the University of Central Arkansas, which is where I ultimately went and graduated later. And we were at I was with friends at the local Dairy Queen where my mom and I went after President Kennedy's assassination. It it was at night, and um, I was up at one of the windows, um, no doubt one of the whites-only windows, and or maybe that had changed by that time, hopefully. I don't remember. Um, But I was ready, getting ready to order, and I was in line, and... Ronnie, my ex-husband, I don't even know if he was in line, but he was standing somewhere close to me, and he said, Hi, what's your name? And I looked at him, and he was kind of weaving, because basically he was drunk the first time I ever met him. He must have been 18, just a freshman in college. And I said, Debbie... And then he said, that's a nice name. I like it. And that was the beginning of our relationship. I dated him all the way through high school. Um, I was uh, one of those kids that missed my adolescence. You know, I remember I was busy being the caretaker for my mother emotionally and dating a college guy I didn't do all the crazy things my my friends did. I was still popular and quite respected and kind of looked up to because I did date a college guy. I remember I was president of the student body, president of Future Teachers of America. I got Key Club Sweetheart, um, just a number of things. And I was also uh, voted most promising actress And so I'm sure it really pissed off my speech teacher that after that, I refused to be in the senior play. Don't ask me why. Anyway, I just didn't have an adolescence. I waited until after my divorce years later when I had two kids, two small children, which is not advisable, by the way. But I will say at this point that we will have our adolescence. We will go through that. And it's uh, uh, much more appropriate, as difficult as it still is, it's much more appropriate to go through it at adolescent age, I would say 15 through 21, than to do it when I did it, uh, which was still my mid to late 20s, but it was much more complicated. Um, so kind of getting back to my father now, um, my husband, well, he wasn't my husband then. He's my ex-husband now. My boyfriend then began flunking out of school, out of 
college. So he could no longer play football. And more importantly, he could be drafted into the Vietnam War. And that is exactly what happened. You have to know that down south, when boys were drafted, nobody went to Canada. Everybody went to Nam. Um, people have often told me, oh, you lived through the 60s. How cool. I said, no, because I was behind the Iron Curtain, the South. We were really like um, a different planet from the rest of the country, especially when it came to the Vietnam War and things like that. Um, no hippies in Arkansas that I ever knew at that time. So he was drafted, but before he was drafted, I decided that we should get married because all of my friends were getting married, not necessarily because their boyfriends were going to Vietnam, but I had already been in several weddings. We get married pretty young down south, or at least we did then. And I'm not saying that the South um, never changes. I am saying, however, that it will be the last place to change. So Ronnie said, okay, you know, because he definitely loved me. I I think I was, I really think I was the love of his life. In fact, I kind of think I still am, even though he's been married twice since. So what we did was, uh, because he had to go into the service, he was going to leave for basic training uh, within 30 days. And in Arkansas, you could not get married uh, that fast. So we decided we would elope. And we would elope to Oklahoma, adjacent to Arkansas, because you could get married quickly there. So we got married, we found this, we took our, my best friend and his best friend who were married at that time, um, Debbie and Jimmy Butler, and we eloped to Poto, Oklahoma. I remember that they had this statue of this wild bull in front of the motel where we stayed. And so we had to, uh, we had to get a marriage license, had to have blood test, all that sort of thing, as I vaguely remember. Um, and we didn't have to, but I wanted to get married in a church. And so we found a church in a neighboring town called Hevener, Hevener, Oklahoma. And we found a preacher there in that church to marry us. So, then we went back to our honeymoon suite at the Poto, Oklahoma Motel with the wild bull statue in the front. And I remembered I, my mother, my mother knew that we were doing this. She didn't like it, but she knew it. I'm sure it just gave her a mini nervous breakdown, but she didn't know what was happening. My dad, on the other hand, who I think still lived in Montgomery, Alabama, did not know what was happening, and I just felt like I had to tell him. I think that was probably due to my OCD. It was one of those obsessions. I mean, I'm going to have to tell him because I just keep thinking about it. So I did call him and said, Dad, I just wanted to tell you that Ronnie and I got married keeping in mind that he did meet Ronnie, did not acknowledge him, shake his hand, say hello to him, was pointed out to him that Ronnie was my boyfriend, but he did not even acknowledge Ronnie's existence at my high school graduation. So his answer to me, or his reply to me when I told him that we had gotten married was simply, good luck, you're gonna need it. And he hung up. Well, that was not exactly what I was hoping for, but it did relieve the anxiety, at least. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to Authentically Debs. And if you like my show, please subscribe, leave a review, and definitely tell a friend. Oh, and make sure to visit my website where you can keep up with my current projects learn a little more about me, and follow my latest news. 
And that website is www.debrajangray.com. The spelling is D E B O R A, no H J A N G R A Y. And most importantly, blessings to everyone. Mm-hmm.